thank you so much for coming to us to, to have this, what I think is a really important discussion. And uh, we have here a panelist of people that have very different and deep views on the topic of people and strategy. And you know what the reason that we, we came to this topic was that if you look at the main strategic concepts over the last 30 years, people are almost never mentioned in them. right? You have Porter's five forces, which is about industry fit with the company, right? You have resource-based competition, which is about companies locking up resources. Um, you have uh, core capabilities, which are people capabilities, but about you know company capabilities, right? And yet, strategy has been around for as long as humans have been around, and it's been about people coming together and making choices. And so, um, we're starting to see the beginning of people coming back in into into strategy. Um, so we have here a panelist of people that have multiple perspectives on the subject. And so what we'll do is we'll kind of have a panel discussion, then we're going to break into groups and have a little bit of discussion and come back together and have another discussion because um, participants are as sort of deeply thinking about the topic as well. Um, so we have Louis Tetu. Did I pronounce you pronounce it? That's okay. Tell me how would you pronounce it? Tetu. Tetu. <laughs> <laughs> He's the CEO of Covio. He is the co-founder of Taleo, um, both of which are really cutting-edge technologies around talent. I will, and I'll, I'll leave, you know, say more about that in a moment. We have Mike Feiner. He's got a whole list of uh, accomplishments. He's the author of uh, one of the greatest books on leadership, The Finer Points of Leadership, spelled F-E-I-N-E-R, Finer Points of Leadership. He's the former chief people officer at Pepsi. He's a former Columbia Business School um, professor and an overall, uh, you know, overall guru. That, and I uh, shoveled snow during the winter. For <laughs> <a year. laughs> Hector Aguilar, um, I met him in Miami. Um, I forget who you were with before you were with GE. Bridge Petroleum, I guess. Oh, Bridge Petroleum, okay. And, um, and then joined GE. He, he spent some time as the head of human resources for Latin America and now has a very interesting role I didn't know existed in GE, um, which is sort of, uh, is it president or is it president of GE Central America? So all of <coughs> GE's dis disparate businesses having one place to go. It's part of the one GE um, right. kind of concept, right? And Sarah Hiberson, our host. She's the head of human resources for L'Oreal USA. And um, you know, like, there's not much more I mean, to say about you know, the diversity of brands and products. It's like L'Oreal's almost uh, hundreds of different companies. Um, and, and, and she finds a way to create the cohesion among them. You know? um, so what we wanted to do is just open it up to have you introduce yourself and, and say something about why you think the, why, why you agreed to come here today? Why do you think this topic because of is you? important? <laughs> <laughs> and, why, and why else? Yeah. Why do you think this topic is important? Just a little bit about yourself and, and, and uh, why is this topic uh, A little bit about myself. Uh, Canadian, <clears throat> French Canadian, um, originally an aerospace engineer and, and helicopter pilot, uh, landed in the software industry uh, and uh, uh, stayed there, ran an ERP company by the name of Bond uh, in the 90s, uh, then started a company by the name of Taleo, uh, which was just bought by Oracle, but essentially uh, was uh, the number one vendor in human capital management solutions all across the world uh, on the internet. Um, and then now uh, running a company by the name of Coveo, which is in the information management space. Um, and uh, and more specifically in the big data and uh, and aggregation of knowledge uh, area uh, through indexing engines, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, why am I interested in the in the topic uh, today? Uh, because I believe that ultimately uh, every company is high velocity, high knowledge, um, and and I'm really intrigued by this uh, this confluence. Of, uh, of knowledge and, and velocity, and I think it turns the whole theories around strategic planning uh, upside down. Um, and I, I guess I'll, I'll stop here, but okay. that's, that's predominantly why I'm interested in, in the topic. And where do you get a chance to hear specifically about what, how Coveo plays a role there? And Mike, would you just 
you say a little bit about yourself and why uh, you think it's important if it is? You know, you covered it. I mean, I was chief people officer at, at uh, Pepsi for 20 years worldwide and then taught at Columbia Business School. Uh, and now I'm at a private equity firm where uh, we own a lot of companies at 500 million to a billion dollars, significantly smaller than Pepsi. And I think uh, no matter how gifted executives are, I think it's very hard for executives to be strategic in a world where the pressure to be tactical and efficient and uh, and deliver quarter to quarter results in public companies <laughs> and uh, quarter to quarter results in private equity owned companies because of the pressure to uh, deliver results. I, I think it's very, very difficult. I've observed executives for most of my career, advised executives for most of my career, uh, regional executives, uh, corporate executives, C-suite executives. I just think it's very difficult, even when they're strategically inclined. The, the, acti the activity trap makes it very difficult. Mm -hmm. And so you can advise, you're a strategic guru yourself, but for them to give share of mind uh, appropriately to that subject is just darn difficult. Mm -hmm. So yes, yeah, so the ideas may be generated, but the context doesn't allow them to... I mean, there's lots of examples of uh, very smart people um, who are so focused on running their business today that um, they don't think about the, the buggy whip that will be displaced, or the steamship that will be displaced. Microsoft's a great example. Really smart people, very driven. Um, they missed the curve, and this is not. A, this is most people would conclude a, an academy company in the technology space. So uh, that, that's 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 a great example. I think. Yeah. Okay. Hector. Yeah. Well. First of all, thanks for, for the invitation. It, that's really a pleasure to, to be sharing this panel with such as important people and, and learning from, from them and from everybody. Well, I, I, uh, I've been, I'm Mexican, born and raised in Mexico. I've been living in five different countries within Latin America and the US, 10 years in the US. And I've been always jumping between business and human resources. So I've been always dealing with, uh, with the people management and the business side. And, and, and as you mentioned at the beginning, I have seen how uh, we do not pay enough attention on the strategic piece in human resources. And it, when I come back to HR, I was always trying to, 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 to share how important it is to, to develop a strategic HR people. But people doesn't get it. So I think that one of the things that I can add here is that different perspective, being, in, being Latin, being uh, managing Latin America, being in different functions in different companies, and having always a challenger of the status quo of, of, of the HR professionals to become strategists. Because you can hire a good strategic people if you do not understand that. And you cannot develop people if you do not understand what a strategy means. Mm -hmm. So I have never seen a, a, a recruiter, junior, or even in the middle um, scale management, recruiting, asking good questions to measure the strategic perspective of a manager. They say, are you an strategic guy? Yes. Oh, shake it. I'm good. I'm glad. <laughs> so, good. Yeah. so but we go and, and start a conversation, and, and we talk about a real case, and you can measure their thinking. So there is no. There is, that skill is not there, so, uh, and I will share some example of how GE, which is a great people developer, is, is, is trying to, to get there. Great, great, excellent. Okay. Sarah. So, so I'm Sarah Hiberson, I'm the head of HR for L'Oreal USA, and uh, I've been with L'Oreal 28 years, so you can imagine I started very junior, and of course I am very American, you can hear, but uh, interestingly enough, I was born in Africa, raised in England, uh, my, my whole family's in Europe, and I lived many places in Europe and then many places in the US, and landed in this area for college. Uh, thought I was going to play professional sports and realized very quickly that field hockey pays nothing, so <laughs> I better get a real job. And uh, 
after a stint of trying for the Olympics, I, I went into the business world and uh, worked for a couple of companies before L'Oreal and uh, have always been in HR, which is actually interesting, not the case of many HR people in the company. But the question of you know, strategy and strategic agility is really quite fascinating for L'Oreal because they talk very much, you know, what is the goal? The goal is a billion new consumers by 2020, very simple, and how are you going to do that through innovation and entrepreneurship? That is our strategy. And everybody goes, I get it, I get it, and how, how am I supposed to be innovative again? And what do you mean entrepreneur? And meanwhile, the company gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and now there's not 10 brands, there's 27 brands. And now we're not in you know, 50 countries, we're in 140 countries. And now that we're in the America zone, which happened last May, we're not just the US anymore, so now we have another letter. So the real question is, how do you allow people to have that agility to be strategic, in our case, be innovative, be entrepreneurial, with all these other things getting in the way? And the reality is it's been proven time and time again that you can meet that. And then you have to look at the reasons of why did it happen? You know, why, why in 1984, when moose, women using moose, the phone moose, never existed, it wasn't a category, nobody used it, and L'Oreal launched it and blew it out. There was no product out there, <coughs> nobody asked for it, quite frankly, there was no market research in 1980. You know? So there's a perfect example of somebody had got the message and turned it into a business, and that's, to me, what it means about the strategic agility in, in a company like ours, in a business, consumer products like us. Yes. Excellent. Um, so we thought we would start the, the discussion, kind of building on what you're saying, sort of painting this vision of a billion entrepreneurs, <coughs> innovators, and so we wanted um, Hector, if you wouldn't mind, just kind of like lay out for us. What do you? What, what, I don't know, so talk about what would the vision look like of a company that's able to create this kind of strategic agility? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, G is clear that I mean, G have been in. in, in, in existence for 130 years so and they have to renew their self or itself every every year because uh, uh, we, we, we we said we are an innovative company but they also realize that in order to be innovative in order to be a strategic you need to have people who is innovative and strategic and, and they start investing a lot of money on, 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 on people and they also realize that if they start early in their career that's easier to create innovation and strategic thinking, not waiting for the people to become a manager to be strategic. So when we hire uh, just a, a entry level people, we assign them since they are interns. We assign them strategic projects. So we give them the project and we expect them to deliver the project with some strategic piece there, mm -hmm. and we ask for that. They may fail. They may be right. Uh, the risk is, 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 is manageable. But uh, so uh, we <coughs> believe that if they start early in their career, it's easier for them to get there. Mm -hmm. So, for, first. Second, we also believe that if we, you share that with your customers as well, it's going to help. For example, right now, I I'm came today from Crotomy, which is our corporate university. Uh, I was there because uh, there is a program called Leadership for Customers, where we take customers. It's the only program where you that you are allowed to. To, to take people into our, our corporate university. And we share with them for three days and a half our leadership philosophy. We talk about leadership as coaching, as uh, innovation, uh, and um, etc. other subjects. But the important piece is that we invest in our customers. They don't pay for this. They just pay their, their travel and entertainment piece. But we pay for, for that, they are tier one and two. Because we do believe that if we also invest in customers on leadership and strategic thinking, they will understand us, and of course we will close the relationship as well. But 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 G is clear on how investing in people development mm -hmm. will help to create the strategic thinking and bringing people into the strategy easier. Mm -hmm. So you create these spaces for them to practice being strategic, yeah. where the risk is contained, where you can observe them, right? Um, so there's a there's an area of this emerging area of strategy called strategy as practice, which is the idea of strategy being what people do, and kind of the framework that researchers look at is people, practices, and 
tools. Um, so we thought it would be neat to just have each of you talk about one of those. But you know, if, you, if, if, if it doesn't hit exactly where you know what, what you what you want to what you want to talk about, then you can sort of redirect. But but we thought, um, Mike, you know, if if you could talk a little bit about the the person, what are, what are the um, characteristics that you want to observe in a person or develop in a person to know that they're capable of taking that project and then the next project and the next project and being strategic? <laughs> uh, you just have to be very courageous because the, the forces in organizations, um, you know, direct people, sometimes consciously, sometimes not, um, to write lots of memos, to justify expenses, to focus on execution, to otherwise be very insular in their current assignment, um, you know, and to test through <coughs> R&D. Um, and so I think people who have some big ideas, or even small ideas, have to be courageous in pushing against the system, mm -hmm. pushing against the, the you know, the, 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 uh, the gnomes who run these divisions or these businesses, you have to tell truth to power. And, um, and, and uh, sure, you have to be smart, you have to be strategic, you have to be innovative, you have to think outside the box. I happen to think that organizations that really are innovative um, have people who are courageous enough to push the system and exhort the system and tweak the system to let them <coughs> really run with some mm -hmm. ideas that could end up being the moose. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there are a lot of forces in organizational life that make it difficult to um, tell the boss that you don't agree and you need more time on this one and you think it will prove out. You know, I remember sitting in a meeting in 1990 in Pepsi where one of our junior marketing managers came in with an idea um, for a, a uh, non-cola, non-soft drink product. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, the C-suite team talked about it and debated it and ultimately said, you know, we're a, we're a big system that, uh, <coughs> you know, <laughs> has big brands. We just don't see, frankly, the opportunity that you're talking about for this juice-based drink. Mm -hmm. If you've been in a soft, if you've been in a in a grocery store later lately, you know, the, that's what you see in in in, in grocery stores. Yeah. You know, a lot of non-cola products. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, some junior marketing managers had this idea, and we told them to go you know, go to the gym and work out. <laughs> um, so I, I think you have to push up against the system um, takes more than just being strategic or innovative and entrepreneurial. You really have to have guts. <clears throat> Sarah, it looked like you were yeah, about to say something absolutely. about that. It's the courage and it's the conviction and the passion and the, uh, the fear of failure, right, gets in the way all the time. That's the challenge, you know. Yep. You, do you, do you take the risk and not get promoted to the next level? What if you fail? What if you don't, you know, who's supporting you? Are you in it on your own? Um, I think that's that's really just a huge um, hurdle, if and, you will. And so in the area of um, practices and processes, yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering, is there something that you can share with us that L'Oreal does to what, encourage the kind of courageous yes. behavior? Yes, yes. We, we have, let's just say we have several individuals who show us signs of innovation and entrepreneurship, but let's just say do not put them in an office with a team of people because they're, they, won't, they won't follow the rules. They won't. So we have what we call incubators, and it's actually under the CMO office, and we take those talents and we give them, we either buy a business, an example would be Baxter, tiny business on the West Coast, <coughs> Menace, I don't even know, it's, what is it, three million, I don't even know, dollars. And we say, here, go play. You know, um, or we say um, all we want you to do is focus on the men's category. That's your job. We don't say what it is. We don't say if it's shampoo. We don't say if it's foundation. We we don't say anything. We just say go play. Um, so because the fear is if we don't keep those people and keep them moving around, they'll leave. Mm -hmm. They won't stay. They won't stay in a big machine and a big a big bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. um, so. But you also need them in the big, the big 
groups, the big names, you know. You need them in the L'Oreal's and the Maybellines of the world, too. So you have to keep bringing them in, but don't leave them there too long. Yes. And that's really what we do. We do a lot of in and, in and out rotations, in and out, in and out. Here's your project, now go here, now go there. Because they, they're not happy being, many times, not to generalize, but they're, they want to, they don't want to stay in one place. Yes. Yeah. Just, just to add to this point that Sarah makes, you know, I, it requires courage and the incubation and a lot of other ideas. But at the end of the day, it does take some far-sighted senior executives to recognize. You know, um, I know the new normal was to have lean headcount and to focus on efficiency. But we need a cadre of people in a whole variety of places where. We're going to let them play, and and it, so it does take some senior sponsorship to recognize exactly. that um, because at the June, at the mid you know regional levels, these people can be iced from the basket. They can be forced to you know do day in and day out sorts of implementation and execution roles. So it takes some sponsorship yeah. from from senior folks. Space. And I do yes, yeah, and I do think as a corporate uh, as a corporation, you know, at the CEO level. There, do, there does have to be certain boundaries that are set, right? So at L'Oreal, it's like, we are beauty, that's all we do. So don't come to me with deodorant, don't come to me with, you know, coffee. It's probably a great idea, but let me just set this straight, we're yep. not doing it. So it doesn't mean it's a free-for-all, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's the idea. It's like, this is what, we're, the strategy is beauty, period. We're the only company that does it, we're number one. It's gonna take a lot to stay number one. So thank you for your idea on coffee, but no. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's also putting the boundaries yeah. on the scope of the project. Yes. Yes, and that those can also limit, create more creativity. The boundaries, right? Yeah. Were you gonna? Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I'm so much in agreement with with what you said. I think I think the biggest. Um, I, I think we're in a unique time where um, the two greatest, um, the confluence of of changes in in leadership culture, combined with technology, which we're going to talk about. Uh, create a very unique environment for certain types of companies that precisely understand that dynamics to thrive and frankly others to die. Um, I think I think on the on this topic of, uh, of leadership um, I couldn't agree more that the role of senior executives is to define the playground but then spend probably 90 percent of your time uh, empowering people and, and, and breaking the organizational barriers uh, to make sure that people understand that they can. Um, uh, they are part of the strategy. I don't believe personally, I've never believed in strategy driven from the top other than defining that playground. Um, I think, I think um, uh, to me, strategy is very much around, obviously, I live in the world of innovation. And if I want to innovate, I want to try to see what other people don't see. Um, and, and seeing what others don't see means I'd rather use the set of eyes of all the employees in the company and of my customers, uh, as opposed to just a pair of eyes of my executive team. Um, and, and so, you know, if you, if you foster that culture, that, that makes a lot of, of, of changes. But I think, I think you, can, um, you, can, you can really succeed. And I'd like to just tell you a story. Um, uh, we started uh, a company, as I said before, by the name of Taleo uh, back in 2000. And uh, Taleo started as, uh, as a recruiting automation company. Um, and initially, I was friend with a couple of executives at PeopleSoft and so on. And uh, we were called a um, um, whole bunch of names because uh, the idea was that PeopleSoft had 72% of the HR software market. And uh, it wouldn't be possible you know, to uh, overtake uh, any part of that, that it was just a function of that and so on. Um, the reality is we thought, and we had done that, that was our third, third tech company. Um, we thought that uh, our agility uh, and our ability precisely to uh, see what they didn't see and, and empower people to act very quickly would outpace them. And the rest is history, obviously, uh, to tell you that the, 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 the end of the story, Oracle bought uh, Taleo for $2 billion last year. Uh, and, uh, and we had 45% of the Fortune 500 market 
uh, by, the, uh, by the time we took the company public in 2005. And my only point in telling that story is that while we had executives from PeopleSoft and from SAP and others telling us that we were doing the wrong thing, we were banking on people and agility um, as the enablers and the drivers of our strategy, um, you know, given a, given a, pl a playground to dominate a space people can, um, um, can, can, can adjust very quickly uh, to the strategy. So, it, so as I said at the beginning, I think it really turns upside down the whole notions of strategic planning and then, and then all of that. And uh, yes, you know, it's, because it happens ongoingly in exactly. part because of technology. Um, so what we wanted to do, because we have some also really Im impressive people participating and we want to make sure that everyone gets involved in the conversation. So we wanted to try something a little bit unorthodox, which is to move the conversation 15 minutes out to the groups and ask each of you to sit with a different group. We've covered people. We've covered, we've covered practice and process. We've covered a little bit of technology. We've covered the vision. And um, have a conversation about what have you seen in your organizations that works or doesn't work and then have a, have, a, have a sharing afterwards and then bring you guys back. You willing to do that? Sure. Are you agile enough sure. to master the ceremony? So um, what we wanted uh, each panelist to do is just very briefly summarize like a key point from the discussion so we can all benefit from all of the discussions and then we'll open up to qu um, questions and answers. Sound good? Um, who would like to go first? Want to go, Louis? Yeah, I could go first. Um, uh, what's fascinating to me, we had a, a very uh, diverse table, uh, uh, people from uh, uh, Moody's and other organizations and, and so on, some very conservative and uh, and uh, someone at our table uh, is involved in, um, in uh, actually providing services uh, for companies basically to help drive the innovation process on behalf of, of her clients. And, uh, and I found that, I find that very fascinating uh, that, uh, that uh, I mean, albeit a beautiful business and uh, that we would, many of us would love to be involved with, uh, but I, I personally found that extremely fascinating that any company would want to outsource innovation. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I'll leave it at that. But, you know, th this, yeah, it, it, posed a, it posed a question for me that, uh, you know, some companies yes. are out there and, and, uh, and thinking about, you know, what's the next thing and what are we going to do? And, uh, and that, frankly, should come from, I, I think it's a failure on the part of management, personally. Mm -hmm. That's, that's mm -hmm. a candid oh, statement. Nice <laughs> yes, <laughs> perfect. It's a debate. I, I don't know. We, yeah. uh, and if you may also introduce yourself, like, like oh, some of us are. I'm, I'm, I'm Karen um, uh, Morris. Morris uh, I've been working in innovation for a while. Um, but my observation here is not so much about innovation as sourcing. Um, I don't think it's a failure of management. I think companies increasingly source everything because you can't have everything you know. Uh, everything you need to know and understand inside, within your walls, from an introspective point of view. So just as you're, you know, developing your internal agilities, to me it's extremely important to source and network as widely as possible the influences and influencers. And even the future of the firm, I, I think, is is shrinking because we're, we're going to look at firms more as connected. Network. So I'm sure your point is very valid if you're saying instead of doing it inside, we're just paying somebody else to do it. But I don't imagine that that's, I was, that's the I was, I was referring to running the actual process. And I agree with you that, you know, you should expand the ecosystem and, and basically source, you know, knowledge and, uh, and cross-pollinate basically any organization with you know anything that comes from the outside as Just much as possible but but I think what we're talking about here is physically running the process of innovation you know delegating that process outside which you know to me is in my field would be would be a guaranteed I, I I'd short the stock <laughs> that's for sure uh, just uh, then they might make the point about the courage and the, you know when you when you 
use that outside person maybe just as a catalyst in the first phase or a phase where it's appropriate, you've taken the fear out of it. That person can speak the truth to power. Well, hence to my that's point, it's a fa that's what I call a failure of management. Mm -hmm. To not allow, to the, not allow that, to not to facilitate to that. Yeah. that. Yeah. 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 Awesome. And I know it exists. In big <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a, yeah. Uh, I thought there were two, you know, we had a very robust discussion. I thought there were two overarching takeaways from it. One was, you know, we, we talked a lot about strategy, but we really didn't define strategy. That what, you know, is it the strategic planning? Uh, is it the implementation of the strategy? We and, and so I thought there was general agreement that at our table that this strategy in a holistic sense is you know who are we and what do we want to be and how do we get there and how do we make sure we uh, we remain relevant as the world changes and as consumer taste change and technological needs change. So it, it wasn't it, it wasn't the kind of tactical, what's the strategic plan and how do we implement it, but mm -hmm. who are we, what do we want to be, how do, how do we, how do we remain, remain vital um, and vibrant and successful. Secondly, I, I thought we had a very interesting discussion around culture because culture is either an enabler of strategic orientation and strategic focus and strategic um, uh, aliveness or it isn't and um, and, and so uh, you know I, we didn't talk about that as a panel but I think culture is directly related to um, whether or not a company really is able to be strategic and part of that culture is just fostering courage on the part of its people and rewarding it and acknowledging it and celebrating it yeah. as opposed to General Motors in 2001 began to learn that their cars were uh, stalling out. Here it is 13 years later and finally it's coming out that the engineering department ever told the people who ought to know that this car is bloody dangerous. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah. something wrong with that culture. By the way, there are cultural issues even in small companies, not just big ones. But I would, I would just I would add to that. I would say culture is strategy. I would say that your strategy are the behaviors, the actions, the choices that your thousand that thousands are made every day. Yes, and, and it's those and norms. That is also those norms are your your it, behaviors. Absolutely, are your culture, it's not right? what's on the wallet card. It's it's the way people behave every day. It's the, the norms of behavior that are rewarded or discouraged. Yeah, I can totally. Agree. Yeah. and I thought we agreed. Yeah, it was a good discussion. Great, awesome. Well, it was a very interesting topic. Uh, we, we discussed about knowledge management, mm -hmm. knowledge creation, knowledge, tra knowledge transfer, and, and the conversation started because um, Robert uh, uh, mentioned uh, something interesting. The baby boomers are retiring, and they're taking a lot of knowledge with them because companies have not been able to manage properly the, 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 and keeping the knowledge within, within the company. So uh, there is a lot of knowledge already created, but again, is not properly managed, and some other knowledge is, is leaving. Mm -hmm. is, is leaving companies. So, and and, and I ask, okay, how do we tie it with strategy? And, and I think that it's you know knowledge creation is, is made by people, and management could be held with with systems. And by the way, they are dealing with G. So it was, I was learning something new about my company that I didn't know <laughs> about <laughs> research and develop our research and development center uh, that is dealing with. Is when most of the of the knowledge is created, mm -hmm. and, and I it's, I'm not surprised that we don't know how to manage it. So, and I'm glad that you guys are dealing with that. I hope that you can do something for us. <laughs> but it's true. I think that it is very true. At, at the end, people and I was talking about uh, encouraging young talent to to do strategic projects and all that. But then, what we do with all <coughs> that knowledge? Yeah. Uh, so that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Is what we discussed. Behaviors, knowledge. Yeah. Sarah? Our, actually, ours, um, we ended up talking about culture as well. Mm -hmm. And you're right, the culture is the strategy, but we were explaining how, you know, there are some companies that have, that have realized that um, they, need, they need outside help because they have identified the problem, but they can't get out of their own way, and they yeah. need somebody to help them navigate through that. Mm -hmm. And there's a real need for that. And then in other cases, um, 
again, the strength of the culture can be the weakness of the culture and how it can be completely conflicted, you know, and that's what we talked about at the table. And again, I won't use the other company, but just to use L'Oreal as an example. So yeah, the strength is we get great ideas, we have great innovation. Uh, innovation. The, the weakness is it takes a miracle to get it done because everybody has an opinion, everybody. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could ask, you know, the, uh, I don't know, the security guard if you want. He can, yeah, everybody has a, everybody has a voice, therefore everybody has a voice. Yeah. And so the fact that everyone will agree will never happen. Yes. So it can take, uh, you know, forever. Um, and yeah. so I think the people that come up with it and want to see it come to fruition get very frustrated because you know, what, why are you getting so involved? You agreed it was a good idea. Now, now we're going to spend, you know, three days negotiating, debating, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that it goes all the way up to the top, top levels, you know, and, and here's the background to it. That L'Oreal believes that the reason we're so successful is because we pay attention to the details. <laughs> we, right? That's why we're so successful. <laughs> so, you know, with thousands of products, I've been in meetings where at the top level, they will literally pick up a mascara one and go, you know, I'm not quite sure the brush. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, we've, you know, yeah. we're launching like next week. You know I mean? So, you know, and so the culture's great, but then here's where yeah. it's not great, right? right? So, right, yeah. We did this, yeah, we did this project. It wasn't with you, it was with the marketing group. Right. It, it touched on a little bit was the idea of <clears throat> what is L'Oreal's, what what's L'Oreal's playbook, the five patterns of behavior that kind of define the culture, and then looking at others' companies and trying to make sure that we, you know, there's playbook asymmetry, that our behaviors are different than other people's behaviors. We didn't get to do it that broadly, but that was, um, that, that I just wanted to uh, comment on the point that Carol, it's Carol, right? Yeah, yeah. Carol was Karen. Karen, I, 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 you know, when I was teaching for 10 years, I did a lot of um, C-suite coaching yeah. of CEO, COOs, and, and invariably I would, and a whole variety of companies, including large ones whose initials are Home Depot, right? <laughs> which, which can be like the Department of Motor Vehicles, right? And I urged these folks to um, seek uh, opportunities to talk with outsiders at a whole variety of levels, other CEOs in other industries, people like yourself, people from McKinsey, um, go to, you know, uh, uh, go to uh, best practice visits to, to companies that really celebrate, you know, customer centricity. I mean, because there's such a focus on the insularity of your own business and your own creative process in that business that you, you, you're, you, you miss the opportunity to put your periscope up and look at what's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. and. Um, some of them did that with vigor and some of them did not. But I, I do think a, a, a variety of forces, internal and external, are very important to making a, to enabling a company to be as strategic as its culture will allow. Uh, awesome. So I would want to open it up to, to, to your questions. You know, speaking of courageous, what, what have we said that was wrong? What's, what, is this, where, what is discussion missed? Where has where the discussion been wrong? What do you have to add here? We have four more minutes for questions. Yes, please. And your name as well, please. Oh, yeah, I'm Jane. Uh, work for Thompson Writers, mm -hmm. um, the marketing strategy. So, Sarah, I have a question about the L'Oreal incubator you just mentioned. So, when you mentioned that, the whole process is sort of two questions. So, one is how how uh, does a company select all the individuals, right? Did you recruit through a special program or you have certain uh, motivations for uh, all the employees to stand up and join the incubator? The second, second one is how did you measure the outcome with this out of the incubator? So um, it was created because we saw talented people failing in the regular system. So, you know, it was because we were failing. It wasn't because we were trying to be ahead of the game. It's like, we don't want to lose this talent, but we can't move them anywhere else because they can't manage people, they can't manage up, they don't know how to put a PowerPoint together, I mean, you name it, you know. But they're smart and they're bright and they have ideas and, you know. So the problem is you can't advertise it 
that way because it's not easy to explain that to a group of talents, right? So we, we selected them quietly um, as new projects became available and we asked them to come and join the team. And in, you could say it was a privilege because, you know, on the flip side, it's a bit questionable. <coughs> what does this mean? What's my next move? The answer is we don't know. Um, and, uh, you know, it was just well received by the presidents and the GMs because they had a talent issue in a group of people. Because sometimes the most creative, innovative create the most problems. So <laughs> it's, that's the, I mean, so it's, that's, Fascinating. And it's on the team you worked with, by the way. So. Oh. <laughs> but say, that's interesting because I think in, the, in many organizations, and that's the town, those people get sort of drummed out of the organization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they, they do cause a lot of disruption and yet they're <coughs> so needed. And I guess I was curious if, if their peers consider that a reward or a punishment. Like, is not being able to follow the rules and getting this job. Is that can say is, you know is that like well unfair or is no. that you know, are people are cool with it or you know I think just because of the nature of the people it's just not on their radar mm -hmm. it's just not you know mm -hmm. what's the right word you know operational business people think exactly that way mm -hmm. why did he why did she get it wait a minute how come they got selected nobody talked but honestly these types of profiles they're, they're just not in that game they're just not. Yeah. They don't even care what you call them. You know, call me president, call me you know, busboy. I really don't care. It's just not yeah. about the title and the level and the recognition and the emails and the get your award. It's just not what motivates them. Yeah, in, in, the, in the research of uh, opportunity recognition and entrepreneurship, it's shown that um, managers are much less likely to recognize an opportunity than an entrepreneur because they're not proactively looking for mm -hmm. opportunities. Okay. Yes. One, one, one question. Sorry. Question. And you're both being experts within the HR world and innovation. It seems that the new generation is coming completely wired, completely different to where we grew up, and motivated by different things and different patterns. We grew up in work hard, be fit, you will be ready. When you're ready, the opportunity will come. Now it's immediate intelligence, short term attention, and so forth. What are the challenges you see ahead as we are tackling in a generation which is motivated by completely different things than what we were? Mm -hmm. I, I share your name as well. And Mariano Alonso, and I run the Western <coughs> Union for for the region. Yeah, look, look at I think in businesses that there there's a need for people who are great at execution. There are, there are needs for people who are great at implementation, who ship, who can make it happen, who deliver. Uh, you know, executional efficiency is important to every business. Um, but I think smart organizations recognize that uh, the entrepreneur in, in a business marches to a different drummer. I mean, it's a different world, and these folks want enormous freedom, they want recognition, and they want flexibility over their schedule. I mean, I've taught at Columbia for 10 years with 28-year-old, to me, kids, brilliant. That's, that's what they're about, many of them. Um, so you need to recognize who those folks are in those businesses and let them let, let them thrive. I, I would say one more thing about you know creating that an opportunity for people like Sarah mentioned. You know, and I'm sort of you know a bumbling old fool, so this is going to sound pretty pedestrian. Um, if you want f to foster. <laughs> Um, strategic thinking in your organization and creativity in your organization, you better goddamn measure it. And, and you know, and if you better tell your senior executives that part of their bonus is going to be mentioned is going to be measured certainly on EBITDA and all you know, all the traditional measures, but um, it's you know, how creative, uh, how many creative ideas came out of their division, how many creative people they are developing in their division. Um, or, and unless you measure it, it it's uh, Usually. it's very it's very unlikely that you're going to systematically build a culture yeah. and a strategic <clears throat> kind of orientation in your business. You better measure it and reward it, and and kick people's fanny when they're just good at EBITDA, but there's no good people growing up in their organization. They're not 
exporting creative people to other parts of the business. Uh, I know this sounds very pedestrian, you're going to reward it. And I could just tell you, you know, um, the very smart people lose IQ points when it comes to money. And, uh, and I see this every day with really smart CEOs. Uh, and I'm on the board of companies that, you know, I'm comp committees, and it, it's quite extraordinary. So if you want to foster that kind of behavior, you better measure it. And, 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 and building on that, uh, uh, you know, part of the challenge, and, and I couldn't agree more, Part of the challenge is that the uh, you know as the cycle times have shrunk over the past 20 years and the measurements have become so short term, uh, the metrics impacted by innovation tend to be longer term. So right. you know, um, especially like in a public company and 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 so on, you know, you're you're you you tend to you tend to you know manage towards uh, the analyst consensus of of the next 90 days, and uh, and obviously that kind of you know doesn't fit very well with your the type of people you describe who tend to see things you know longer differently or you know longer term or uh, tend to see the wave ahead you know that that nobody else sees mm -hmm. and I think as a leader you need to balance both basically yeah. Yeah. Right, so a little bit my question builds on yours which is I don't talk much about I'm Amy by the way um, about just attracting and selecting the right talent is to your point you know, some people are really, really great at driving execution, and some people who are a little better at strategy innovation um, certainly in this world aren't necessarily um, top of the list to be selected into <coughs> legacy companies. So what's your perspective on you know, the companies that you're associated with? Are you really focusing on talent selection and the acquisition of really diverse employees? So you, you have that complement of people who are thinking differently. I'd like to I'd like to offer a, a piece of answer. Um, uh, Taleo worked in, in in the recruiting automation space and uh, processed a fairly large volume with a lot of companies, and we've seen you know many companies behave very differently from a recruiting perspective. Um, I think I think um, uh, you know the the traditional the the best models that we've seen in some of the highest performing companies. We're recruiting in ways that are very untraditional. Uh, the traditional way of writing a job description, which is essentially a cut and paste of what people currently do every day, uh, and uh, and measuring uh, what people have done against that, and uh, and basically hiring against that is probably the worst one. Um, uh, so you know the, the, the best that we've seen are people are companies that hire for culture. Uh, you know, first and foremost, actually we had uh, uh, customers and, and, and one of them in particular, a Fortune 50 company, that will hire people, uh, but typically not in a role. They will hire people who fit culturally the organization, and then they will assign them in a role afterwards, and they'll move them around within an organization. Uh, the other element is 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 uh, is back. I use the term cross pollination before, and I use that term personally very often because I believe it's one of the most powerful forces of nature. Um, and 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 what I mean by that is that you you cannot find innovation within homogeneity. And 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 so by definition, if you want innovation, you need to you need to get on board. You need to find a place, a home. Uh, like Sarah said, for, for people who think differently, who have different backgrounds, etc. So, you know, one of the great mechanisms in recruiting in particular, and I'll stop there, is to try to find, um, try to find evidence uh, when, you, when you are looking for some roles like that. And I agree with Michael, there are some people who just need to ship products on the loading dock, and that's a different thing, obviously. Um, but uh, but one of the ways in recruiting is to find evidence of, of, of ways through which individuals have gone outside of their comfort zone, uh, you know, done di different things and, and et cetera, you know, and it's, it can be multiple things. But, you know, I know in our companies we look for people who have traveled a lot, who have done things differently, who have, you know, backgrounds that you'd, you'd be surprised actually at some of the people that uh, you know. We hired a Broadway actor and and uh, as as our head of consulting, um, you know, literally, and uh, they know them, they know him well, and 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 you know, 
It's 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 it, and it, and that's what brings innovation and 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 newness to the equation. Again. But but if <clears throat> you can hire lots of diverse people, but the pressures within most human systems True. are to prompt people to to get along and conform and to 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 uh, fit in and to integrate and to acclimate all the words that are used in organizations and in fact a part of appraisal systems, um, nauseating as that is. <laughs> and so it's, it's, you know, Steve Jobs started a skunk works for Apple, right? He took all those folks off site, uh, which is why Apple, with all the mistakes they made over time, uh, you know, ultimately, you know, early on was successful. So I, I think you can bring in very creative, innovative people and some of the things that we just mentioned I think are important. But you made you you need to make sure you're creating the right kind of skunk works within the organization. Otherwise, those folks are uh, are iced. Yeah. Well, maybe, and I don't know how you do this. I have no answer. You're all the specialists. I've been concerned with. We do hire with the unit of measurement being the individual and their skills, and worst case, as you alluded to, the job description. Um, if we could find a way of hiring on the level of the team, you know, and when I mean, look at the most diverse groups in the world. They're, they're soccer teams, mm -hmm. right? You hardly have one, mm -hmm. two people on the team now, the winning ones that speak mm -hmm. the same language or come from the same country, and everything is around the team. And of course, that's a failed metaphor for for business, perhaps. Is that something that's even thought about that you can? think too that, that, that in, a, in a way of looking at human potential as, as not this one person but how this one person within the culture can be part of our team building. That's a, that is a, I think that's such an intriguing idea but I got no um, and at the same time I'm feeling that pressure now of <laughs> that um, you know we don't have enough time to, to talk about this right. And what we're and, and, and right now we don't have enough time to actually talk about this. We we've got a huge topic that we've started untangling, and there's so many aspects of it to discuss. So um, what I would propose, since it's getting close to eight o'clock, what we'll do is um, that we close up the conversation, which is by necessity given the topic it has to be. Um, I'm going to close up the conversation and uh, allow it to continue um, in the group. We want to thank you so much for taking time to...